Hello, my name is Elder Price, and I would like to share with you the most amazing book. Hello, my name is Elder Grant. It's a book about America a long, long time ago. It has so many awesome parts. You simply won't believe how much this book can change your life. Hello, my name is Elder Green. I would like to share with you this book of Jesus Christ. Hello, my name is Elder Young. Hello, did you know that Jesus lived here in the USA? You can read all about it now. Hello, in this nifty book, it's free. No, you don't have to pay. Hello, hello, my name is Elder Smith. And can I leave this book with you for you to just peruse? Hello. My name is Elder Bundy, and uh, I too used to be, or I am Doug Bundy, I used to be Elder Bundy out there a long time ago, uh, like these young elders, these young sisters, ringing doorbells and trying to talk to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ as a Mormon missionary. But now I'm here as your host on uh, Voices from the Dust TV for Monday, the 24th day of February 2014, if you can believe it. We welcome you to our show where we share the reason for the hope within us, the reason why the Latter-day Saints are Christians, and the reason why you should be too. Our message not only explains what distinguishes LDS Christian doctrine from non-LDS Christian doctrine, but... Uh, it also explains why since 1845 the Mormons have been proclaiming to everybody that would listen to them that the uh, only hope remaining for the Gentiles is, the, uh, is to repent, to be baptized, and to uh, thus be identified, to be numbered with the house of Israel, to be identified in the same covenant and to worship at the same altar as Israel. Well, uh, we've discussed these things and much more in past episodes of Voices from the Dust, both radio and TV, where you can access from our website, VoicesFromTheDust.org, uh, and uh, also on our YouTube channel, Voices from the Dust. The live show, as well as the archives, can also be found on Google Plus and uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, and now on Facebook, the Facebook page entitled Voices from the Dust. So all of these are Voices from the Dust in all of these uh, venues, and so it's easy to find. And just uh, if you go to Facebook, uh, Voices from the Dust page, just click on the ta tab labeled KVFD TV Live to watch today's program, or click on KVFD TV Yesterday to watch yesterday's program. Actually, I think I didn't put that up on Facebook today. Oh, I just really realized that. So I'll have to do that here before we get going. But in the meantime, I'm uh, happy to see that we're joined today by Sam, uh, Elder Samuel Richardson, and also uh, Spencer. So uh, a couple of our regular guests on today. Uh, let me... Uh, have them say hello to you while I go try to remedy that problem and get things put up there on uh, on Facebook. Hi, Doug. Hello, Spencer. Hi. I guess I wasn't muting, was I? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, uh, see if you can carry on a little bit of conversation while I do this. Just take me a minute. And that would really help this morning. Maybe you could tell us about your weekend or something. Oh, well, my weekend was just uh, kind of uh, a little bit of a... Well, we, everybody in my family was coughing, so we all we stayed home. Um, but we were... Uh, we had a nice breakfast and um, the uh, you know usual family, um, family activities. Um, watched The Sound of Music. I don't know if you guys ever watched that movie, but... It's, it's a nice movie. Several times. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I heard. I heard that the last person from that died this weekend, some or something. Did you guys hear that? 
the the Von Trapp family. Oh, you're talking about the Trapp family and not the actors. Yeah. I want to say the last person from the original Von Trapp family died this weekend. It was like the second daughter. I don't think that's Liesel. I think it's, uh, I don't know. I was looking for a link on that. So if anybody happens to see that, I'd be interested in reading that story. My wife also watched a documentary on them. So it was very interesting. And I, and I at one time, I'd like to, to see that documentary. Um, It'd be interesting to compare. There, there was yeah. There was one line that in the in the movie that I thought was interesting. Um, uh, well, uh, there's several lines, but I mean the one that I thought was interesting was um, uh, where was it? I have it written down. Um, hang on a sec here. Uh, wrong thing. Sorry. Uh, it's over here. All right. So here, here we go. Um, there's two excerpts. One was Rolf, if you remember, he's the um, the boyfriend of Liesel. And later in the movie, he becomes like he's full Nazi and everything. Right. And he says, we make it our business to know everything about everyone. <laughs> and the other excerpt was uh, from Heyer Zeller, where he says, "We sent you were sent a telegram which you did not answer. He's talking to, to Captain Von Trapp. Uh, a telegram from Admiral von Schreiber of the Navy of the Third Reich. And Captain von Trapp says, I was under the impression, Herr Her Zeller, that the contents of telegrams in Austria are private, at least the Austria I know. And uh, I, I just thought that was an interesting comparison to um, um, the, the current events of today and... and, and uh, what conclusions you could draw from that, but I, 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 I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm not, I'm not a politician or anything, or somebody who knows politics that well. But I just thought it was an interesting. Hi, Bomo. Hey there. Sorry, I'm late. Hi, John. Or Bomo. Sorry, Bomo, sorry. <laughs> Speaking of movies, um, there are movies that are very uplifting, uplifting that aren't. Uh, uh, made by the church or maybe aren't that religious um, my book my son uh, was not believing for a while and when, when he was younger about the time he got married he uh, read the book Les Miserables and the uh, incident where the priest forgave Jean Valjean of robbing his silver and telling him he missed the candlesticks too, touched my son's heart, and he came back into full activity in the church because of that. Not because the m movie, the message in the movie told him that the Mormons were right. It's just that he came back to what he was used to believing. He said, "If that's Christianity, I want to be part of that." Thank you. That was a very good scene. I agree. I, I've. Uh... I like that. I've always meant to go back and read the book, but I've watched uh, performances of it in the music, and um, a really, really impressive movie or show or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's a very, very wonderful message. I love the message of that of that show. Mm -hmm. um, so I would recommend anybody who who likes likes Christianity or likes beautiful messages. I mean, that's just a great that has a great theme, and I, I agree. Well, guys, thanks for taking up the time. I uh, managed to get one of them on there, the live one. So hopefully, if anybody wants to watch that, I'll have to do the other one later because I, like I said, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> so I, I get confused. But anyway, uh, welcome, Bomo. Hi there. We. Uh, uh, don't have Roy today. I, I haven't heard. Uh, he may be usually on Mondays. He takes care of medical things and so on. He has to go is, do that. Is that an artwork, yeah. Bomo? <laughs> I've always meant to ask you. Is that an artwork? Uh, no, it's a horse. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, what are they? <laughs> oh, this is the Book of Mormon thing. The thing that I can't. Okay, yeah, okay, never mind. Yeah, the e What do they call it? It's, an, the, it's a tapir. Tapir. That's yeah. what it was. Tapir that they thought might be the horses. 
because there were no there have been there's been no evidence that horses existed in uh, the Americas during the time that the Book of Mormon depicts it as being. Do you want to yeah. share with us your your statement about tapirs about the 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 picture so that the <laughs> that the name of my tapir is beyond you. That's right. Beyond <laughs> you. <laughs> so that when when Captain Moroni is is majestically astride his his regal tapir and it and it wheels up, you know, he can say, "Whoa, be unto you! Whoa, be unto you!" <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, I think I I would suggest you go back and watch some of our previous episodes, so that you can see the other side of the Book of Mormon there, Bomo. But at any rate, uh, I you know today we want to uh, and we've been talking about the last on the last. Uh, what ten programs? This is uh, the the uh, final five programs starting today of the fifteen that we plan to explain why I told Sean McCraney that the church was going down. And uh, although I expected to be asked to explain such a startling belief uh, on his show, <laughs> that that never happened. I said it on both times I appeared, and and he caught it because he referred. To it in his summary for the third show, but but he never uh, asked me to explain, and maybe that's a good thing because I probably wouldn't have been able to do very do much justice to it on the show there, but with not enough time. But uh, at any rate, now we've been elaborating why this is why I said what I did for the last two weeks, and this is beginning the third of the uh, third week, the final week. Uh, but what I, if I had been asked on that show, I would have said that the fall was inevitable, given that the fate of the United States of America and the church's uh, intimate connection with the U.S. and its institutions today, with the uh, uh, intimate connections, I'd say just with the U.S., but but with the um, Gentiles in general. I don't know, you know, because we've got. We've got all kinds of Latter-day Saints that are leaders, both leaders in the church and leaders in the governments of the Gentiles and so on. So, uh, you if have the to government clarify is, what you mean by going down, though. Do you mean that the doctrine and teachings of the church will have been gradually led astray and eventually so far away from the truth that the church will fall? Or do you simply mean that the church is going down on the sinking ship of the Titanic of America, and so it'll have yeah, to pick itself ladder. up again. Yeah, it's going down because the United States is going down. It's going down from the external enemy that we see in the parable that comes and breaks down by night, breaks down the constitution that protects the church. The servants of the Lord then flee, and uh, the twelve trees are broken down, and the works of the servants are destroyed. So in a similar so, vein than the Grand Elks Lodge of, uh, you know, Puxtatawney, Philadelphia is also going down. Yeah, the whole nation is of the Gentiles, all the Gentile nations are going down. We'll talk a little bit about this later. But I think it, it implied the church because as we get with the Book of Mormon, we see that the Lord says that, because of the unbelief of those to whom the the book which uh, he's referring to, which comes forth as a sign to his people, the Gentiles, there's among those that don't believe it, uh, are uh, it, are the cause. I've I kind of slaughtered this, but because of their unbelief, uh, the church is marred. The servants of the Lord are marred. But he says they're not hurt. Now I'm not sure exactly how to to interpret that. You know, being marred but not hurt is uh, you know something we could discuss. I'm not sure, but he says he will heal him because his hands, his life, the life of his servant is in his hands, and he shall heal him. So by connecting the the parable 101 with what the Lord said, what Jesus said in third Nephi of, of uh, the Book of Mormon, then we come up with this specific idea of the church going down. The United States is going down, but the church is going down too. And I think that's we'll see a little bit of that today because of the persecution. Remember, 
in, and we discussed this again in, in previous episodes, but uh, if you recall in 1st Nephi and 2nd Nephi, the angel is explaining to uh, Nephi what's going to happen in the latter days, and he sees what happened in the former days. Now, after the gospel went forth to the Gentiles in purity, it was corrupted and many plain and precious things went away by the church that's called the harlot, the whore of all the earth that is um, founded by the devil and that yokes down the saints and tortures them and kills them and so on. And, uh, and of course, this is a, uh, identifiable with Revelations, so whore in Revelations, which it says all nations drink of the forn of the wrath of the fornication or the wine of the wrath of the fornication of of uh, that whore well anyway that's so that's the idea all of this has to come together it's not just a church in isolation we don't see the government continuing and the society of the gentiles continuing on and the church becoming a foot that's not the way that's why i had to spend these three weeks to try to explain what was happening. And the picture that we painted is uh, uh, one where the uh, uh, church is uh, 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 represented by these 12 trees that are broken down and uh, as the Quorum of the Twelve. And that they were planted and they grew up, but then this uh, tower was not built so that uh, the uh, servants of the Lord couldn't see uh, uh, far off into the distance uh, when the, not if, but when, it says in the parable, the enemy would come. So uh, we take this specific look at it, but all of it in the, in the context of the Book of Mormon where such judgment falls upon the Gentiles as described if they reject the fullness of the gospel while they're guilty of all these horrible sins and hypocrisy and everything, the judgments of, the, of God fall upon them, and they're swept off this land, which is a choice land above all other lands. And the Lord says, all nations that possess it must serve him, who, who uh, Jesus Christ, who is the God of the land, or else be swept off in the, when they're fully ripened, see, in iniquity. And so we see all these things coming together, but uh, it's not easy to summarize it all. Well, so anyway... What we've uh, what we've seen is uh, that the church and the government kind of go down together. The kingdom of God rises uh, eventually, however, to take its rightful place as the protector and guardian of the revived church. Uh, after the after it goes down, it comes back, and for the maintenance uh, uh, and promulgation and protection of civil and religious liberty. In this land and throughout the world, the kingdom of God is established, which is more than the church. It's separate from the church. And remember we read that. We'll read it again here. The quote uh, in the Revelation reported in a couple of journals that uh, uh, Michael, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, forgotten. His name skipped me for a minute. But uh, the guy that wrote... Uh, uh, the Council of the Fifty document uh, that we were talking about uh, Friday. Uh, Quinn, Michael Quinn. And uh, and so he has that quote, and I took it out of his paper. But as I have been explaining in this series of programs, this vision of the fate of the church and the destiny of the country comes from the words of Jesus in the Book of Mormon, where he prophesies of the marring and the subsequent need for the healing of his servant who is declaring the fullness of the gospel. We're able to understand this. And uh, this marring and healing, um, need for healing, uh, comes because those who do not believe of the fullness of the gospel that is declared unto them by the servant of the Lord bring about this. Now, now it doesn't say that they, that they are the ones that do the marring, but because of them it says that the servant is marred. And then this marring is seen as presaging of, of sorts of the events that then are described in the parable that the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith in December of 1833, which describes the establishment and fall of the 
uh, LDS Church in America when it's interpreted in, in terms of the planting and eventually the breaking down of the twelve apostles and the scattering of the Lord's servants and the destruction of their works by the enemy of God who overcomes the US Constitution which is protecting the church and the liberty and freedom of Gentiles in America by stealth and deceit that's the thing see it comes by night and as we have seen however this there's this uh, ironic twist to the drama uh, that if the servants of the Lord had kept his commandment to watch for the enemy by means of a special edifice, a tower, he commanded them to build, they would have been able to discern the movements of the enemy early on in sufficient time to prepare to defend America and the church. However, this interpretation of the parable has not been taught by the church, which is natural because otherwise they would have built the tower, right? If they would have understood it. They don't see the fate of the church in the land of America in connection with this marring of the Lord's servant and his subsequent healing which Jesus taught in the Book of Mormon at least publicly they know indeed there's no official explanation of the parable that I can find given by the leaders of the church uh, be, rather they just simply defer to the explanation given by a past scholar Sidney B. Sperry who was a prominent and prolific author and member of the church but not a general ecclesiastical leader so they defer to him and he uh, his interpretation of the parable is very flawed we can see that now it's viewed as describing something that is already passed and over and is the therefore the parable is only profitable for instructional purposes to teach the saints good principles of faith and obedience and so on uh, with a real example, but it's not seen as something connected with the flight of the servants, the breaking down of the twelve apostles, and the destruction of the works of the church in days to come. The key to understanding the latter interpretation is found, in my opinion, in viewing the symbolic elements of the parable, such as the heads, the twelve trees, the tower, and the enemy, in terms of the global context of the church in America today rather than in the local church, uh, con in the local context, the Missouri context of the church in 1830 America. And I think not a lot of people would be, it wouldn't be hard to convince a lot of people that that's the case, because that makes much more sense. Today the church is established in most of the countries of the world. It claims, what, 15 million members, 14, 15 million members. In the 1830s, it had just been organized in the United States, and its membership amounted to a few thousand in America and Britain. In the meantime, though, we have this account of the angel's message to Nephi in the Book of Mormon, which gives us to understand that the great and abominable church, the whore of all the earth, with whom all the nations of the earth have drunk, of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication uh, John says in, in the book of Revelation in the New Testament and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies uh, we see gathering then this entity rather than the Missouri mob gathers multitudes upon all the face of the earth to fight against the Lamb of God so I think that makes it very clear we're talking about the latter days in this and not the days of the 1830s. However, uh, the wrath of God is then poured out upon all nations, the angel says, and there begins to be wars and rumors of wars among all the nations which belong, it says, which belong to the mother of abominations. Now that's a very interesting wor uh, wording there and we need to understand what that means. But, uh, I think it means that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlot, harlots which includes all the Gentile nations because you know you remember those the big picture of, of uh, Tony Blair going to the I think he even converted to Catholicism and going and kissing uh, the ring of the Pope and and uh, you see all the leaders of the world all go to the Pope and uh, we've seen what Clinton there I don't know if Obama has gone there <laughs> or not but uh, all the rest have 
And what's really interesting now is this Karen Hudis, who used to be the chief counsel of the World Bank and saw what they were doing and, and has become a whistleblower with all the rest of them. Uh, and she's saying that a full 60% of our taxes that come from the American people at least goes to the Vatican. And after, after Britain takes 40 not Britain itself, but the globalists take 40% uh, off the top, then the rest, 60%, goes to the Vatican. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I've never been able to find out how she uh, documents that, but, but we're going to find out uh, sooner or later. But it's for sure that the wrath of God is being poured out upon all the nations. We're on the verge of World War III. It's just incredible. Most, that most people don't realize that this is going on. It, it's, the reason is probably because they've uh, been blinded and, and uh, dumbed down, but, and the media doesn't report it, so they don't understand what's actually happening. But we are on the very verge of World War III in lots of ways. So there's wars and rumors of wars among all the nations which belong to the mother of harlots. All right, well, the angel goes on to tell us in in uh, first and second Nephi that when this judgment of God that we are now seeing falls upon the mother of harlots, it is then that the father shall commence in preparing the way. See, he shall commence. The angel says in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants which he has made to his people who are of the house of Israel. See, now that's really, really critical to understand. Because if we understand how the church goes down in this parable, and the servants of the Lord, after doing all of this work, have, a, a, have a, arisen in fright and fear, and uh, seeing the enemy in front of them, they flee away, and he destroys uh, the trees and the works of the servants, then the Lord comes and says, what is the cause of this great evil? Didn't I tell you to build this tower? And if you had, you had been able to see the enemy and, and prevent this from happening because you would have been able to make ready and not uh, uh, suffer that my vineyard should fall into the hands of the, the destroyer. See, he upbraids him a little bit, but then right away he calls one of his servants and he says, go gather the strength of my house and, uh, and uh, my warriors, my young men, my middle-aged men, and, and then uh, come and, and redeem my vineyard by force, see? A military march. So his servant that he's talking to there is later identified as Joseph Smith. So this presents a very huge enigma to us, which we'll get into details further on in the week, I guess. But... Uh, because uh, he's he's uh, you know of course been dead now for many years, and uh, so it seems very difficult to understand how it is that he is going to be the one to gather together uh, the warriors of the Lord's house to go and redeem uh, this uh, uh, vineyard of his, and throw down the towers of the enemy and break down their hedges, and. Uh, and uh, avenge him of the of his enemies in as much as they're opposed. So that we see this military uh, civil because he also goes to establish the uh, government uh, of the people there in the vineyard and also uh, uh, a religious leader because he builds the temple that is referred to in the Book of Mormon where the Lord says the power of heaven will come down among the inhabitants of New Jerusalem and that the Lord himself will be in their midst. So this is, uh, this is the other part. Now, we'll have to try to explain the details of that during uh, the rest of the week. But uh, I wanted to go on uh, and, and make this clear that uh, this is an important transition that the Lord refers to in First and Second Nephi. When the wars are poured out upon the nations, that's when... He commences to prepare the way for the gathering in of his people. Well, we might think, well, what has been going on all this time? Uh, but you see, the gathering of his people have been really 
among the Gentiles. It's the Gentiles who have repented and been numbered with his people. But the, uh, the, uh, there's much to say about the remnant of Joseph in this land yet and, uh, and the part that they will play. And then the Gentiles will assist them in building this new city. So what we see in this parable is that transition. The transitioning from the enemy breaking through the hedge and the servants fleeing and the uh, works destroyed and the trees broken down to when the army of the Lord comes to redeem his land because it's mine, he says, I have bought it with money. So it's clear that the world is just now on the verge of seeing all this come to pass. But this was not so in 1830. <laughs> it's clear to me, I don't know. Is it clear to any of you guys that, that this uh, interpretation of our modern times, the modern context, is, fits the parable much more clearly in the Book of Mormon prophecies, much more clearly than it would have in the, in the days of uh, Joseph Smith when uh, the Missourians chased the saints out of Missouri? Nostradamus made a bunch of uh, writings that people found patterns that matched what they believed the course of human history to be. So when you go back retrospectively and concurrently try to find meaning in things that have already been written, I mean, you're going to find you're going to be able to rationalize and bend things. I mean, the fact that you're taking something that's a literal tower and then transmuting it to be uh, a non a kind of an abstract reference to an organization of people is a form of kind of bending and warping things to meet a pattern. That's that's yeah, all it is. Yeah, that's an interesting interpretation. What do you, what do you think, Spencer? Well, maybe he's been occupied. What do you think, Sam? Uh, yeah, you know, I think I think Momo has a point. Um, it, it could be that it is stretching. Uh, it could also be that if if it is true and real, that uh, your your view makes point uh, makes sense as well. Uh, all uh, fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, or predictions is either stretched or if it's true it isn't. Uh, I uh, used to think that the the church was going down before I ever met you, uh, Doug. Oh really? I wondered myself if, if the church was going down, not because of section 101 but because of those uh, prophecies in Nephi. And, uh -huh. and uh, I wasn't trying to make anything fit, uh, like Bomo says. It just came to mind, and then when you verified that, that made me wonder. Well, maybe there's some sense to that. Well, that's interesting because uh, there also the we see, and we're going to see that a little bit more. These are the prophecies that people should be talking about of Joseph Smith that are coming to pass. This gathering, for instance, of the whore of all the earth to fight against the land. Them. See, that's really, and then the, the, the Lord says that, uh, that the glory, uh, his glory is involved in the, pers in the preservation of, of his saints. So that is really, really interesting, but we don't get more, uh, many details about what that's happening. So, Doug, I have a quick question. So if we put the, sure, go ahead. Um, this term, the whore of all the earth, the whore of Babylon, all these other things, so what is the metaphor there? Because it seems like a very sexist term um, to, to use whore. It's just kind of a loaded language. Is, is there something more to that metaphor? Or is it just like we're going to use a bad, you know, a, a name for a bad Oh, word? no. There, it's very, very uh, instructive. It, it, it comes from way back in the Old Testament where uh, the Jews went whoring after idols. So the Lord compared his covenant relationship him as the covenant uh, relationship in marriage, and that they were married to him, and um, and and then it, but they went whoring after other gods. They they uh, uh, like a, a woman, a wife that was unfaithful. So then that's picked up in the New Testament by John, and uh, this horror that's writing. Uh, the back of this multi-headed beast 
and and so this becomes a symbol then of this um, breaking of the covenant. So what's the name? The Is there a masculine the version of that word? Like Joseph Smith went out and had relations with other women that he didn't tell his well, first wife out about. Well, the but, church but acknowledges no, uh, that. There, there isn't. There isn't. There's no masculine version. It's all, like I said, it's very, very ancient. The, the whore of Babylon, it's called, and uh, we could get into more details of it. But, but in essence, this idea. I always wondered, what does he mean by the fact that they drink of the wrath of the fornic, uh, no, the wrath of the wine of the fornication of the whore? Well. What that's referring to is that because of the, no, this is my opinion again, I forget to keep inserting that, but uh, it's referring to the horror that has, that the nations have had to suffer because of the union of the, of the uh, church and state. See, so uh, there again, the female... Uh, version of, of somebody like that uh, fits so very well. The wrath of the wine. See, the wine is what, you know, they celebrated, they drank in celebration of their union, but that really meant horror and misery and uh, destitution for the nations that receive, you know, the consequences of this union. So anyway, well, let's keep going or we're going to run out of time to get through this. But uh, looking back, we can see how the Jesuits of the great and abominable church embarked on a murderous campaign uh, to counter the Protestant Ref Reformation by lying and manipulating and deceiving the governments and the institutions of the Protestant Gentiles until today the they all belong to it in one way or another. That's why that word "belong" was so important in that whole idea of the of the whore. So the results of this effort can be seen on many fronts by those with eyes to see. The words of the angel foretelling the formation of the whore of all the earth, with the devil founding it, and it's gathering together multitudes to fight against the Lamb, all clearly manifest themselves today in the work of secret combinations, which work has commenced among the global elite and is spreading uh, throughout the world. This international cabal referred to as the terrible one in Isaiah has spread its secret oaths to all nations, enabling uh, leaders of the nations who belong to the harlot to get gain and to become popular in the eyes of men and to pursue the lusts of the flesh with abandon and to get power over others as we uh, are taught in more detail towards the end of the Book of Mormon when we read about how it was the source of the destruction of both the Nephites and the Jaredites. And uh, Moroni warns us that it will be among us as well and that we should await to a sense of our awful situation and not suffer it to get above us uh, because of the destruction that will follow soon after. Well, this gathering together of the multitudes then to fight against the Lamb includes more than the political leaders of the world. It also includes the religious leaders of the world, which again is what this imagery of the whore is all about. The religious uh, component is the, uh, is the, is the uh, uh, harlot and the national component is the beast, the government. So... Uh, you can find many instances of non-LDS Christians who are today alarmed by this development that uh, that the angel was talking about, where they are being gathered. They call it ecumenicism, and they're being gathered in all from all parts of the world. And and the uh, you know the uh, non-LDS Christian uh, I don't know whether to call them faction. I'll just call them world non-LDS Christian world is uh, more and more being beguiled by it uh, to the uh, great alarm of those who consider themselves as literal followers of the Bible. And uh, we've played that before. We, uh, In fact, maybe, I guess we have enough time. Let's, let's uh, maybe play that clip that I think epitomizes this uh, that was... Uh, 
uh, we got from Joe Hagman when they were discussing this w with uh, Steve Quayle and, and Pastor Langford on one of their shows. This was very enlightening. Let me It's real short, so let me play for at least half of it. Yes, we are, and we're not only talking about the salvation of one soul, we're talking about things that the, as Mr. Marzulli said, you know, the, the church has shied away from this big time. It's not just the, you know, the demonic element that they tend not to preach on it is encompassing anything that doesn't fit a feel-good message. You know, there are even churches that won't preach on sin anymore. It, it seems like, and we always talk about churches, and I'm not trying to, you know, gang stockpile on them here and just tear them down, but we need a transformation of the body of the people. I mean, church is, is great, but if the church is not doing what it's supposed to do, then we need to find our churches that are, and if we can't find any, then we need to make one. Uh. <laughs> so that's where he's uh, saying, really acknowledging, although they hang, hung up on me when I tried to talk to him when they found out I was latter, a Latter-day Saint, but uh, they uh, they really see the need because of this uh, change that where uh, the great whore of all the earth is gathering together the multitudes upon the face of the earth. Now, I found yesterday a video where the message of the new Jesuit Pope, Pope Francis, to American evangelicals is received by them with the most enthusiastic of responses. They were actually standing on their feet with their hands raised to heaven, shouting praises to God and praying uh, that the Pope's... Uh, efforts would be successful. Now, let's try to watch that. I'm going to uh, bring it up on the screen share here and uh, it will uh, be instructive for us. Um, uh, I won't play the whole thing, but I'll try to go through it. Uh, we'll be able to... Uh, when I say go through it, just... Uh, See here, I don't know if you, hopefully, somebody tell me if this is coming through all right. Can you see this? Hello? I can, I can see it. Okay, good. So you see this guy here uh, that's talking in the beginning, and he's saying to them that the protest of Luther is over because of the changes that the Catholic Church have made should bring them together now, and he and he uh, reads this, you know, that uh, the doctrine now of the Catholic Church is that we are saved by grace and not by works, lest any man should boast. And uh, he puts that, so now the, that was done in 1999, he says, and so we should uh, no longer uh, protest. You know, if the protest of Luther is over, he says, then you're, we need to know if your protest is over. You know, you need to not resist. I mean, it was very well put by this guy, but we don't have time to play the whole thing. And then he played this video of the Pope, see? And the Pope, uh, speaking in, it in Italian with uh, English subtitles, tells them uh, essentially the same thing. It's time to be unified. It's time to come together. Uh, both... Uh, uh, Protestants and Catholics and even atheists and even Muslims, he says, you know, everybody. The, the, his statement, of course, caused a lot of brouhaha among the Christian world when he included uh, salvation for atheists even, but uh, nevertheless he did. Now I'm going to start the video just as he ends here, and then we're going to see what their reaction is. E io ti benedico, che fratello a fratello, un abbraccio, grazie. Father, we, we answer his request. 
And since we know not how to pray for him as we ought other than to agree with him in his quest and in, in his, his, his heart for the unity of the body of Christ. We come together in the unity of our faith. Hallelujah. So, Father, we just, all of us... Anyway, you get the idea there. Uh, so, uh, this is a what uh, uh, what others are seeing and uh, it's really really accelerating now if you, you couldn't have imagined such a thing taking place uh, even with Kenneth Copeland a few years ago but boy howdy it's really moving apace and uh, what uh, what we do now what we want to see is how you know, we go back and we see in the Council of the Fifty how that council was really formed. It says, um, well, let's read that quote that we read from uh, Michael Quinn. Read it again. Thus saith the Lord God, who rules in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, I have entered my kingdom and my government, even the kingdom of God, that my servants have hitherto for heretofore prophesied of, and that I am taught my disciples to pray for, saying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, for the protection of my church, and for the maintenance, promulgation, and protection of civil and religious liberty in this nation and throughout the world. And all men of every nation, color, and creed shall yet be protected and shielded thereby, and every nation and kindred and people and tongue shall yet bow the knee to me and acknowledge me to be Amon Christ, which means the God anointed of God, God anointed ones, to the glory of God the Father. Well, as Bomo pointed out yes or Friday, uh, this um, paper by Ehad, I can't remember his first name, was entitled, It Seems Like uh, Heaven Has Begun on Earth. And that was a quote taken from uh, William Clayton, who was, of course, part of all of this and who had earlier apostatized from Joseph Smith, but had come back and been forgiven in a real touching story there. But he was the father, he was the... Uh, um, clerk, so to speak, that took uh, that took all the notes that now are going to be um, published that have been released for publication by the church through the uh, Joseph Smith Papers Project. So that's going to be very, very interesting because those are the minutes that he kept of their meetings. And we're going to see how this Council of the Fifty was uh, intended by Joseph Smith to play uh, such a significant part, but it never did. As Michael Quinn points out, uh, the Council of Fifty was prosaic rather than awesome, uh, he says, he writes. And he writes this because there were many who got the wrong idea thinking that, that it was awesome and it was this uh, government that was uh, hidden from the eyes of the world and and so on. It's very intriguing, but he sort of uh, uh, is icono kind of iconoclastic towards that. He says, he goes on to say, at the most practical level, the Council of Fifty was the debating school, quote unquote, Apostle George A. Smith called it in 1849. That was just after the Saints had gotten out here in 1847, wasn't it? I think, a couple years. But buttressed by oaths of secrecy, the Council of Fifty provided a forum to give the church hierarchy different views on, pre on pressing questions of political, economic, and social significance for the Latter-day Saints. Undoubtedly, the presidency and apostles of the church did not prearrange all the deliberations and decisions of the Council of Fifty, but the opinions 
and recommendations of the presidency and the apostles carried conclusive weight in the discussions of the Council of Fifty. So here we see this uh, idea, that's the end of the quote, here we see this idea is, is brought out how, uh, that is so uh, important in, in this idea of local versus global. See, during, during their day, uh, the uh, um, uh, where was I? I want to quote it. The political science that he, he talks about, uh, and the uh, uh, darn it, I just cannot talk and see something at the same time. I know it's sit right here in front of me. I just read it, but I can't see it. Why I don't know, but wh what did he say about the political questions of the time? And, uh, why I just read it and yet I can't see the words right in front of me. I don't know. Anyway, it's in there. I know it's in there unless I am just seeing things. Oh, there it is. Okay, different views provided a forum. See, this is important. A forum to give the church hierarchy various different views on pressing questions of political, economic, and social significance for the Latter-day Saints. Now put that in a modern context. In those days, the, 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 the uh, council figured that it had a, an understanding itself, the apostles I'm talking about. The apostles didn't need to have these things brought to their attention, they knew all about the matters concerning the Latter-day Saints. In the context of the pioneers trying to establish the kingdom of God and, and, and the church, see? But what they didn't understand is that they didn't and they needed this council to understand what was happening far away, far down the road, where the Jesuits were forming, where the they were taking over the Masons, uh, where they were infiltrating, what they had done back in the days of the, of the uh, English monarchy and the struggles of people there and uh, what had taken place in other parts of the world, which they wouldn't have been able to know. But with, the members, with members of the council that might have been taken from experts in these areas, they would have been able to see what we can now see in re retrospect. They would have been able maybe to take before the Lord to these conspiracy, conspiracy theories. They would have been able to theorize, because that's what the Lord told them to do in section 88, verse 78, that you read the Friday, I think, Sam. They said, teach ye diligently, and my grace shall uh, attend you, the Lord said. And uh, teach ye theory, and that was number one on the list, and uh, gospel doctrine and the law and so on, principles and law. Well, we don't do that, but they would have done that in the Council of the Fifty. Somebody might have brought uh, some issue up that had to do with banking, uh, uh, the central banking, for instance, or uh, that has gone on, and the attempts of the uh, uh, elite to get control of of the uh, American system. Maybe they would have been by that time to see what happened to Lincoln and why he was assassinated and how that uh, that was part of a plot. It would have been a conspiracy theory, but then what would happen? It, if the issue was brought up uh, uh, through the prophet, he was convinced enough that we, they should inquire of the Lord what would have happened in that uh, council. Well, according to the rules, they would have had to vote. They would have had to have some kind of a, of, a, of a conclusion presented to them of what was happening and maybe what was a wise course of action in view of what was happening. And then maybe somebody would have proposed something, you see, along those lines, maybe an educational program, maybe something to go out to the Latter-day Saints to wake them up. I don't know. It's hard to say. But you can envision, you could write a fiction story that would include this. And then they would go before the Lord and they would have to become one before the Lord in asking Him uh, that. They would have to come to a unanimous conclusion 
and it would have to be a revelation from the Lord the way this is written because that's the only way it could happen and so that is a presage of the government that is to come because Jesus Christ will not personally rule on this earth until after he comes in clothed in the brightness of his glory and even then Joseph said you know he won't personally dwell on the earth but will come and go and uh, but uh, certainly the government will be on his shoulders the Isaiah says and uh, so those men who represent the mortals on this earth during that time who who are placed at the head of the various government uh, agencies and whatever it might entail would have to receive revelation in the same manner as this Council of 50 is supposed to receive it according to the uh, the uh, things that we're seeing here regarding that. Well, <laughs> Bomo's not interrupting me, but I'm sure he has uh, uh, a lot to say about this. It might seem really bogus to him. But to me, I get excited almost as William Clayton did because I see this coming in the future when we won't be ruled by corruptible men. I, I have no comment because it's a fanciful fiction that... Uh, is purely speculative and there is a preponderance of evidence that would lead you to not really give it any credence and so I'm 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 reading something else while I listen to you it's interesting okay good well maybe you'll be able to bring that up but uh, we've got just a few minutes left now and uh, I want I'm glad to have gotten it out on the table I, I think you can see that it that it's a very complex and difficult thing to get it out on the table and if you take any part of it and, uh, and and put that out there without explaining the context of what you're saying it's very difficult to understand but uh, it, you I know, do think all it's a little bit disingenuous just because when you say the church is going down everyone assumes that you're talking about the leadership of the church due to apostasy or something like that if you're just saying the church is going down as analogous to the US is going down then you may as well just say the US is going down well, and, but, the, but the point is is that the Latter-day Saints don't see the church going down they remember this is and when you take this in light of what uh, West Webster Tarpley wrote, for instance, in, in his book, you know, uh, during the election campaign of Mitt Romney, when he talked about Mitt Romney, the Mormon, I can't remember the exact uh, uh, title of it, but the Mormon takeover of America was this was the uh, uh, subtitle, and uh, he in that book shows that you know he takes all these things that we're talking about and more not really this part but uh, the part that has to do with that white horse prophecy right? and he tries to make it look like they're in cahoots with the global elite and uh, it's a Mormon takeover of the world so well, it brings up a good question if you've ever read a Tom Clancy novel then you've seen he tends to throw Mormons into CIA and FBI areas and and I can tell you from working in government that there are a whole lot of Mormons in government. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you think there's so many Mormons in government? Exactly. Well, it doesn't matter why there are. We can say why they are, but the point is, is that there are, and there's more of them, and they're in leadership positions, and so that leads credence to this whole idea of a Mormon takeover of the United States. So when I say that the church is going down, that is not ingenuous. You well, see? I used to think that the reason that they were there were so many of them is that people trusted them, and they were trustworthy, and and they were honest workers, and I I still think that they are, but you know that's why people tended to look for them. I think Howard Hughes was another eccentric rich guy who tried to get Mormons to work for him, and people said, well, it's because he can trust them. But yeah. my perspective now is a little bit different from that. I think the reason that Mormons are particularly useful in government yeah. is because they have been raised in an environment where they 
suppress their own will and conscience and place themselves within a hierarchy structure where they're willing to follow yeah, orders from a yeah, higher yeah, authority. But, but I think that's a very minor thing. The thing is, you said it was ingenuous that I just should have said that the United States is going down. But it isn't, you see. This idea, it's against this idea that uh, the United States is going to be taken over by the Mormons. Not that it's going, that the Mormons are going down with it. So it, what I'm trying to get you to admit then, Bomo, is that that was a mischaracterization for you Characterization for you to say that I was being in ingenuous. I I withdraw the word. I didn't mean disingenuous as a negative point. I, mean I meant just uh, it, I guess confusing or or it it just because I think if you would ask Spencer or Sam what they thought when they first heard you say the church is going down, they probably would not have said, oh well, he means that the U.S. is going down and the church as part of the U.S. is going to go down too. From a physical standpoint, I think they probably would have. M thought you meant something different, but that's well, my. I, I, I can say something if you want. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I did mention on the second program that it was the United States was going down. I said that the church is going down because the United States is going down. If you recall. All right, go ahead, uh, Spencer. Um, well, I think that when when I heard him say that, I think that what I thought of I, was I had not. Um, been uh, aware of, of that particular pro prophecy in the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm not as familiar with the Doctrine and Covenants as I think, as I think Doug is. But I certainly believed that um, based on talks from the, from the conferences that I've, that I've been listening to, that the church is about to receive a lot of attention in, in various ways. And I think that's certainly true. We, we can see from uh, a lot of the things that have happened because of the, uh, the Proposition 8, because of um, the recent change in uh, the uh, in Congress, is, was, sorry, was, sorry, with uh, the Supreme Court cases regarding the LGBT. Um, well, I don't know enough about them to talk about them, but I know that there are issues that are coming up and that my children will, will have to address. Uh, so I know that these things are, are slowly coming coming into it. If you remember my discussion about the pie, the apple pie, um, right now I think the apple pie, the, the apple in the, in the pie of America right now, at least currently, is, well, maybe not currently, maybe this is in the past, was um, prayer in church, in schools and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's, that's the apple that we don't have in schools right now. That's the apple we, that we don't have in government. We don't have, um, uh, you know, in God we trust. That's that seems like a, a sin to say now. That's that's what we've slowly been pulling out. <laughs> that's right. That's a good observation. <laughs> um, I think I think John has one interesting point, and I think it's something maybe he hasn't said, but he's tried to say, and I think he said he said it to me on a number of occasions, and that is that he he wants he wants truth. He wants more information, and I think the reason he wants more information is because he has a problem. Um, Consider, for example, the different prophets in the in, in the in the Book of Mormon in the Bible that had this same problem, like Abraham, who's told to sacrifice his son, or Le or Nephi was told to uh, cut cut off uh, Laban's head. And you know, we know in Nephi's case, you know, he said, "Whoa, wait a second, I don't want to do that. I've never I've never shed the blood of man." And so, what do we do in these instances where um, we receive a commandment that seems at least to our musings or to to our inner reasoning, totally contrary. I mean, if you want to take it, you know, this this has a full spectrum. When you go take it all the way up to like uh, where the the Israelites were told to look at look at the brass serpent to be healed. That that sounds ridiculous um, that that could do it. But yet here we are. We're we're listening to a prophet. In that case, you're listening to a prophet. But some cases, like in Nephi's case, he's he's talking right to the spirit. You know, so how do you? The question he needs to that he's struggling with, and I think that all of us have struggled with, but we have come up with different answers, different solutions to that to that dilemma. Is you know, what do you do when when things don't don't fall into the normal category? And I think what he wants is he wants an answer. He wants an answer to that to that question. And um, Bomo wants an answer. You mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. Bomo wants. Well, I think we all do in a sense. But yeah. I think that for, for some of us, we're willing to wait and, 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 and continue learning all the different things. But I think for, for Bomo, he really wants that answer now. 
and he wants the church to provide it, or he wants someone to provide it. Uh, right now, according right now, I think what the answer that he's tried to collect is, well, no, using reason, using int intellect, we can see that from history, this doesn't make sense. So this 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 doesn't follow the normal flow. So based on that, based on that reasoning, um, it doesn't make sense, and and there's no reason to do to do it. And scientifically, you know, pulling things apart in your mind, why would I want to do any other thing? And I think that if we were to say, John, you know. If you were given the, the decision of, of that Abraham was given, he would say, "Well, heck no, I wouldn't do that." Um, so, Especially yeah. Right. yeah. So, I, that that's what I wanted to say, and I I, I, I see that that's that for me anyway. I think I, I see that that's a problem. Maybe he would disagree with me. But. Well, I think the search for truth is a big part of what anyone who transitions out of Mormonism goes through because Mormonism makes such bold claims of truth and authority and so you you get raised believing that it's important because they told you it was important. They said that, you know, you have to have the right authority for baptism. So you could start thinking, well, authority is really significant, it's really meaningful. And then when you start to see the chinks in the armor and you start to see the inconsistencies, then you start saying, well, wait a second, they taught me that authority and truth are really important and that they were the ones with the right authority and the right truth so you go searching and you say well wait a second if there are all these inconsistencies in what is supposed to be the truth then what do you use to rely on truth Can anymore I, one one well, I'll inter interject one thought here and that is that um, I have kids and many times I try to tell them the right thing to do but just like my grandparents and myself you know I'm not perfect and I, I can't wait around until I've got it all figured out. I've, I've got to, to kind of, I've got to hit the ground running, you know, with, with whatever I've got in my bag and whatever I don't, I'm going to have to make, I have to go with it. I mean, our, our, our ancestors weren't perfect either. They, they had mistakes, they had flaws, but they still had a good message. They still hoped that their children would improve upon whatever they were able to provide them. Uh, true, true, and unrelated. <laughs> well, Anyway, I see what he's pointing out to. Sam, do you have any comments you'd like to, to make on all this before we uh, close down here? Uh, no, that uh, that pretty well covers it. I couldn't say it any better than either you uh, said it. Okay, well, uh, tomorrow then we'll continue with this uh, idea, although Bomo thinks it's uh, pretty much speculation. I just wanted to and make the point that that's always the case when you're talking about interpreting prophecy uh, and that's what the council would have been uh, faced with you know well uh, because they would maybe have had questions about theory and so on and so that's why the rules and the things that uh, that they were uh, really supposed to be doing and why they were called a debating school by the apostle George A. Smith uh, makes it also so interesting uh, of course, what I say to those that don't believe uh, what that are Latter-day Saints, believing Latter-day Saints, but don't believe that this interpretation is better than the, than the earlier one by Sidney Sperry, uh, I just ask them to open their eyes and see what's happening. You can see it literally coming to pass as uh, as uh, the parable shows it to come to pass. So. Anyway, we're going to be talking about other aspects of it. We want to get to the uh, redemption access uh, or redemption part of it. That's very interesting where the Lord sends his servant, uh, Joseph Smith, to gather the warriors of his, of his uh, house, the, the, his young warriors as he calls them. All right, well, anyway, we'll uh, leave it there. And as always, I hope everybody has a good day and I wish that uh, I pray that the Lord's choicest blessings will be with us all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.